You're listening to Let's Talk Sustainable Business. Hello, my name is Uwe Schulte and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this episode in our series, Let's Talk Sustainable Business, which is brought to you by the conference board Global Sustainability Center. Today, I'm welcoming back Ken Bowles, Chief Financial Officer at Smurfit Kappa, one of the world's leading corrugated paper packaging companies. In our last episode, Ken gave an overview of the circular business model transformation at Smurfit Kappa. Welcome back, Ken. Thanks, Uwe. Good to be back. Ken, today we would like to hear a bit more about the sustainability performance and examples of sustainable packaging solutions. Let's start with an overview of um, what you would call your material impact with respect to energy, water, carbon footprint, and also waste. Sure. Um, it's, it's, it's a wide-ranging question, so I'll, I'll try and fit as, as much in as I can, and, and please, if I miss something, uh, by all means, by all means, ask me. I suppose we we've set a goal for 2050 to be, be carbon carbon neutral. That that clearly is something that will move over time because I think ultimately carbon neutrality would become you know all GHGs in time, all greenhouse gases neutrality. I think would be really the standard when we get to 2050. I think it could either be new standards will come in around biodiversity loss and things like that. But at the moment. You know, we, we have an, a target or an aim to be at least net zero by 2050. Um, and, and within that, I think, you know, we like to set kind of more firm targets. So we have a target to be 55 percent less CO2 by 2030. Uh, and we're very much on, on track for that target. And, and, you know, at the end of we just issued our, our, our sustainable development report for 2021. And we're about 42 percent as we, as we stand now. So very much on track for that one. That target's firm because you know we've set out a, a series of projects from a from a capital perspective that will will achieve that, um, and and really that that's always been the kind of philosophy. We we tend not to set targets that we we don't believe we can meet. We don't think uh, you know there's there's always a difference between ambition and target, and I think both are valuable. But you got to be able to kind of manage both in the context of of how you're you're dealing with your stakeholders and and the reality of situations. So. Um, so net fit, net zero by 2050, 55 percent by 2030, and, and really 80 percent of, of all our footprint comes from what we do in paper. Um, so really, where we get the biggest impacts is in our paper system. So if, if we focus there on reducing energy use, so using less energy to make the same type of products, clearly the move to more renewable types of energy, um, biomass, green electricity. And I suppose maybe for context, if we kind of split our scope one, two and threes in, in a kind of a you know, about 50% of our emissions are scope one. So they tend to be at the, at the gas, mostly gas at the mill sites. Um, about 15% tends to be scope two. And that's really electricity throughout our corrugated system. And then the balance is really scope three, um, so we'll call it 35%. And and really, you know, that's going to be our focus in, in the more near term. We're, we're really well set on one and two, and we've a bit more work to do on, on, on scope three, I think. Um, but you know we, we've been validated by sbti at being below two percent which is the best in our industry um and and that that's really been a, a great achievement by by, by garrett quinn who's our head of sustainability to get there because it's, it's not an easy project um it's a lot of engagement and, and to achieve that result is fantastic and and that that means that we know we have external assurance for our 55 percent which is always valuable i think for stakeholders and you know look it's 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 like everything, you know, people say, well, how are you going to get to net zero by 2050? And, and the real answer is actually, we don't know yet. You know, the reality is that, you know, you go past 2030, new technology will take definitely play a part. You know, will hydrogen play a big part? Um, you know, will reuse and recycle get better in terms of carbon intensity and less so? Um, but I think it's important to have the ambition out there. And I think it's important to drive the organization towards that goal. And within that set targets that are achievable. So if you like broad, broad strokes, that's where we sit on carbon. Then we equally have lots of targets around waste to, water, waste to landfill reduction, which we'll absolutely hit before 2030. We want to bring that to zero. We tend to, you know, with a chain of custody target of over 98%, meaning that our customers have really full certainty over the, the greenness, if you like, of the supply chain. And, 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 you know, the last bit then is about, about water intake. And it's, it's a funny target for us because actually we don't, we don't consume water. Uh, as an industry, we we process water, 
So generally what we do is put water back into the environment in, in a much cleaner way than it came to us in the first place, because in it, to make to make the kind of paper we make and as beautiful as it is, you, really, you do need really clean water. Um, and that, that's what we aim to do. Uh, and clearly they have benefits for local communities too, in terms of the overall water supply. So we don't impact the water table in that way. And it sort of goes back to part of the conversation we had earlier, which is, you know, really, when we think about our business model being circular, that has to start with limiting the impact on the environment and the resources you take from it in the first place. You can't just focus on the end of life. You've got to go right back to the start again and make sure that, you know, you leave as little or no footprint as you possibly can. And that's really what the targets are designed to do. Uh, that um, I must say, Ken, I, I would uh, be very glad if a number of people who have made net zero commitments uh, and now saying, oh, oh dear, um, we hadn't realized what scope three is all about, uh, will listen to what you've just said. I'd, I'd rather have very realistic targets uh, than um, ju just putting something ambitious out there and having no plan how to achieve it. So that... I, I think is, 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 is extremely valid. And, um, but I think we should just clarify an uh, uh, expression you used, uh, chain of custody. Can you just ex explain that? Because not everybody uh, you know, understands the forestry implications. Sure. So it, it's, you, the world has got ever more concerned about not only the product they're consuming, but how that product is consumed and made in the first instance and, and where the, the, in our case, the fibers for that product come from. So, you know, our customers are, are really interested to make sure that that, you know, that forestry doesn't come from any conflict wood. And so, for example, you know, the current conflict uh, in Russia, Ukraine, the, the wood now coming out of Russia is designated as conflict wood. And so it would fail FSC certification. So we, we couldn't and we don't use anyway, but we couldn't use that wood in our products for our customers because we couldn't guarantee them chain of custody of their product. So we built a system that says if you get a box from Surf of Kappa, as, as with any of our major customers, you can look back through the, the production of that product right back to the source of fiber. And we can tell you the source of fiber and the certification from it. So, for example, our, our forestry we own in Colombia are certified by FSC for for long 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 number of years now um and equally the fibers we, we secure from third parties and, and and the paper we buy from third parties equally chain of custody certified so we're not unique in that but i think it's 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 valuable for our customer to be able to say to their customer the end consumer that your your product does not you know does not impeach any laws around conflict wood or the modern slavery act or the use of, of in, in certain industries you get you have issues around child labor for example so that that's a very important statement, and, and then you know people will see that on boxes. If if hopefully after the end of this, people will begin to go into supermarkets and turn boxes upside down like I do, to see what's on the end. And if they do, they'll see little things like FSC, uh, and they then they'll know actually this box is sustainably made and comes from sources that have been certified to be you know, non-conflict. Um, that that's quite valuable for the consumer, I think, and, and getting more valuable in a world that's becoming more aware of those kind of topics. Excellent. I just realized that, you know, I asked you for, about an expression you used, and we both used the expression scope three. Let's just make sure that uh, our uh, uh, audience is also aware. I, I, I think 90% are, but let's just make sure. Scope one and two is under your control. It's your production and the energy you directly buy. Scope three is whatever happens upstream in your supply chain and uh, in the use and the final disposal of, of your product. That That is scope three, right? Yeah, so I suppose you know our our scope three is where we can have the greatest impact for our customers. So when our our customers you know set targets for twenty thirty and beyond, really where they're impacting mostly probably is around scope three, and that's where they look to producers like us and their packaging suppliers to, to kind of help them. So I, I see our own scope three is 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 a number in itself, but actually our greatest opportunity is is enabling the reduction of scope three emissions for all our customers. It's it's a great opportunity. That leads us directly into my my next point, uh, Ken. You know, we at the conference board always try to say um, uh, that companies have to be aware that working for a positive impact in sustainability, you have to collaborate with others. And and you just talked about your customers. Um, can you give us an example of uh, how you work with customers uh, to do something about that? 
Sure. I, I suppose I was going to say hot off the press, but probably in the case of this product, it's probably cold off the press is probably more appropriate. Um, it's, it's a product called Thermobox, for example. So traditionally you would have, you know, things like fish being, being shipped long distances in, in EPS or expanded polystyrene containers. Um, we'd, we'd have a view, I think, which would be largely shared that EPS is probably not the most sustainable of products in the longer term in terms of its production. Um, or indeed its recyclability or the end of life solution. So in, in our case, then we, we kind of look for alternatives for, for customers to that who are looking for a more sustainable way of that. And, and so EPS is that white, white fluffy stuff that polystyrene. Yeah. The, the, the thing that no matter how hard you try to not make it go all over your floor and carpet, it absolutely always does every single time. Yeah. As, as a five-year-old child, it's a wonderful toy as a, as an adult trying to get rid of it. It's just a nightmare. Um, it just appears everywhere, but it's that exactly that. And it's mostly air, but the 1% is, 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 um, is the bit we worry about. Um, so we invented the Thermobox or, or the, the guys in, in the business did, um, and it's hundred percent recyclable, uh, you know, and that, that's the first thing. And you can actually keep food at even lower temperatures than you might be able to do with EPS. So it clearly gives a benefit from, from the end consumer around, I, I know my packaging is now sustainable. And I know that actually, you know, my, my product is probably from a, a food safety perspective, probably better because actually the temperatures are lower. Um, but the real benefits then come through the supply chain. So if you think about, uh, you know, EPS, you probably it, it, it's kind of pre-made, comes in the shape you need it. Corrugated by its nature can come flat. You know, and we find this equally with agricultural trays. So you can you can store them flat. So your, your ability to to kind of store much more of your raw material or your, or your packaging product uh is 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 much greater with thermobox so you store it flat when you, you need it you just erect it and then off you go and that, that can be handy uv particularly in, in busy times because you know some customers find that uh, and we found that with, with a different customer and how we solved the problem which was they found that when they were really really busy they ran out of you know the reusable plastic crates that you see in supermarkets they actually ran out of those when they were busy so we, pl we replaced all those with corrugated board which meant that they never ran out um, but also they could print on them for campaigns. So they became much more of a marketing product than they were a transport product. Um, but back to kind of the Thermobox, the Thermobox does very similar things. You can print on it, you can make it campaign based, you can, you can do whatever you want in terms of colors, but logistically you store flat, your supply chain is always full in terms of packaging, packaging kind of supplies. And so you can see how it can have wonderful application, not only in the retail sector, but clearly through e-commerce also, because you can, you know, e-commerce boxes are becoming the norm in terms of, of, of how we might deliver things. And, and the Thermobox fits the e-commerce environment just as much as it fits the retail environment. So it, it's ways like that where, you know, we, we, we kind of work with the customer because sometimes it's, it's the customer. We, we have a kind of concept here of kind of trying to understand the customer's pain. So sometimes it's not really that they're looking for a different type of box. Sometimes it's, it's kind of that they're looking for and they haven't kind of figured it out yet, but it's, it's where are they, where are they on that sustainable journey? Where are they on the kind of brand promise and what the consumer wants from that? And that's really where something like Thermobox fits in perfectly. No, I, you know, I, I, I used to be one, one of those procurement guys, but it's so long ago, I've, I've more or less forgotten about it, but one of the mantras was always, you know, um, you shouldn't try to invent everything yourself. You should really work with your suppliers because they they might have ideas of solutions which you haven't even dreamt of possible. And this sounds a little bit like it. I'm I'm almost dare to say, why haven't we had this earlier? I, I suppose that you know, in some ways, the, the technology hasn't been there in terms of you know things like food contact and and being able to ensure those kind of things, being able to work with a box that that can go through the supply chain like that. Um, some is actually Ube quite simply because, you know, as an industry and particularly smart pick we didn't think like that before. You know, if, if you, if you came to us in, in your former life, you'd say, Ken, you know, my box costs too much. Uh, I need to reduce the cost of my box. Um, which I'm sure you did. <laughs> and, and we would have said, well, okay, Ube, we'll, we'll re-engineer the box likely. And, and there you go. Whereas now, you know, we, we do things with customers and say, okay, well, let's, let's think about the problem in a different kind of way. Maybe it's maybe it's not that you know you you get the the savings from changing the box fundamentally or making it a different box from a cost perspective. Maybe actually we re-engineer the box that says you get twice as many pallets on a truck 
and therefore you take half the trucks off the road and not only reduce the logistics cost but also take out the co2 so what if in what if in the, in our relationship we re-engineer the box but you get sustainability savings so it's 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 that i think which is the changed conversation between particularly smart for cap i think i think we 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 really are uh, in a unique place on this around you know you can the customer can get any box they want but is it the box they need and actually is it the right box and they're they're the more rich conversations we were able to have and, and our teams have with our customers i think you know we see that around us um, in in everything we do but those those kind of more discrete bits the ability to kind of impact things beyond the re-engineered box particularly from a sustainability perspective i think are ever more valuable in, in that in that case i gave you we took a thousand trucks off a year and we saved them 500 tons of co2 you know that that was you could you could argue that's kind of free for them you know but so they get the benefit but clearly we get the relationship so it, it works both ways no, I, I I understand that this is a, a mutual beneficial point, and I think this is an important point beyond just uh, y- your uh, specific case. Uh, people are starting to realize that uh, you know, in the good old days, people said uh, you know, let's avoid risks when they talked about uh, environment and all of that, and uh, also social impact. And nowadays, people start to understand that it, this is a new frame of thinking. And therefore, new innovations come about, and I think your thermobox is uh, is an excellent example. Let's dwell a little bit more on your transport savings there, because I think this is impo- this is a very important one. Um, because again, we're looking at a system rather than um, uh, j- just a single product or something like this. Can you ex- extend that a little bit more so that our audience understands how this is done? Um. We start off with a fundamental problem that when you're shipping corrugated, you're shipping air. Right? So, uh, you, so distribution and logistics become ever more important. Paper, paper is great because paper, big reels of paper can go anywhere, you know, and, and, and largely they can go by rail or boat. So they, they tend to be less impactful from a, from a CO2 perspective in terms of where they get there. But trucks, trucks on roads, we, we know that, you know, corrugated doesn't travel more than 250 kilometers, but that can be a lot of trips. And for our customers, then they clearly have to get their product to wherever it's going. And, and you know, 80, 75, 80% of our customers are FMCG. So, you know, food, beverage, those kind of those kind of um, sectors. So their products are going to you know supermarkets and retail environments across a much bigger network than ours. So clearly the impact for them is it was uh, it, 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 it can be greater. So the more we can do to, to kind of impact that, um, and again, it goes back to scope three because this is part of their scope three emissions. Uh, it's helpful. So you know, we did we did something for a uh, a windscreen manufacturer for the automotive industry where they they actually came to us looking for a a box that would be more mono material. Um, and uh, so we we actually engineered a box that is mono material, so just corrugated, but actually fits twice as many screens on a truck as before. Um, and and that becomes that they become that that sort of makes people kind of sit up and think, okay, I got to think about this differently now because I wasn't expecting that. And and that that generates a much greater conversation than in other products. You know, we had another customer. It, it, we actually had somebody come to us who wasn't a customer, as it happens. But what was happening was that their their box was being crushed in transport. Um, so when it got to their supplier, it was being rejected because the box just wasn't working. Um, go back 10 years, we would have just said, okay, we make you a stronger box and that's great, isn't it? Um, but actually we said, but do you realize that, you know, you've got three products here. It was, it was kind of wine for a retail environment. You've got three products here and, and they're different price points, but I can't tell the difference between the price points. Um, so we actually said, can we take it away and not only look at the problem around the crush of the box on the truck, but can we look fundamentally at what your, what your box is doing? So we took it away. Uh, re-engineered the box and re-engineered the design and they, they actually added up with 17 percent increase in sales and that was verified by a third party as a result of the change design so I, I think that that's where innovation kind of plays a part and it's that customer didn't want anything but can you please stop my box being crushed in transport um so they they became a customer not only a customer but then you know a customer that felt wow this this goes way beyond just the, the box manufacturer this crowd can actually help us impact and increase sales um so it, it's it's now and there's many many things like that around the group um 
largely, you know, what we're finding lately is, uh, you know, this idea of, and we do this with a North American customer, where people are trying to connect now more the brand identity and brand promise back to the product they receive. So we, we have a customer in North America and, and they'd be sustainable by nature. They make a product for, for the household environment that, that you know, helps reduce the, environment, the, the energy footprint of homes. But the product problem was when the customer opened their box, it had polystyrene inside as a, as a kind of protective, as a protective kind of coating. So you sort of, you get this disconnect between what you tell me you're sustainable and your product is sustainable. Yes, I'm, I'm dealing with unsustainable products. So we actually have a, we have a product called Hexacomb, which is to keep it simple, it's, it's kind of like honeycomb in, in terms of shape. It's actually corrugated board, kind of you know transversed, which, which gives it great strength. Um, so we actually replaced all the the polystyrene in that case with with hexacomb, which means then when the customer opens the box, they're met with one monomaterial, fully recyclable packaging, one bin to put in, not having to worry about the environmental impact because it's all going back to be recycled. And the customer then clearly has a, a situation where his brand promise is meeting his brand packaging. Um, so there, I suppose there's just some examples in a way of, of, of where those things kind of fit in. When, when I'm listening to all these innovations, and they are impressive, I must say, uh, um, I've come to the point, do we actually still need plastic in packaging? Uh, yes, we do. I mean, I, uh, you know. Oh, dear. I, I, I thought I asked the wrong guy. No, I t because, you know, I, I think sometimes the, the conversation can be misunderstood sometimes. I think what what we're interested in is reducing waste and so we're we're about waste reduction and that that's equally you know a box that's engineered wrong and is too big for the product or has air inside it you know or is too heavy that they're all that's all waste a box that that takes too much co2 to produce is waste or you know so when we think about plastic we, we think about waste I, I think what we say is if if there is a more sustainable alternative to the plastic product and we can do it then i think that's that's a space in which we play and i think you, you think you think about something in that space like you know recently we launched a thing called um the, the top lock box you know so you know in supermarkets you have those rigid plastic containers for you know detergent tablets and they have a they have a, a kind of a click top box that's you know uh, secure for children for a long number of years, we we we, were, we we couldn't crack the kind of security aspects of that, but we have now. We have a child, a child lock, child secure version of that and corrugated. So there's no reason why, and it's on supermarket shelves now. There's no reason why that plastic container can't be replaced by a corrugated alternative because it's it's it fundamentally is more sustainable. But then there's lots of ways that plastic plays a part in in avoiding food waste. You know, sometimes. You get products wrapped in, in, in cling film that that preserves the, the, the food length, the, the food life length. Um, so we're not interested in creating a different kind of waste problem by moving to corrugated, but we are interested in removing waste where we can. But but plastic clearly has a part to play. You know we haven't invented the see through the see through water bottle yet, um, but when we do, we'll go after that. But for the moment, there's certain products where plastic clearly has an advantage. Um, but I think it goes back to the kind of waste conversation, and and within that very much around the end of life so we sort of know that you know ultimately our product will return to nature you know in a very short period of time i think that's probably the key differentiator between our product and, and other products which is you, you don't see our product on a beach you don't see it you know becoming a, a an island in the pacific you, you know, people don't have a problem in, in terms of what they might do so um it, it really is about the kind of end of life no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you say that. Uh, we, we have in the conference board also spent some time in looking at the, the consequences of plastic waste and what can be done about it. And I think uh, building a really good infrastructure uh, for making it a lot better recycling will be one of the big challenges. Uh, the, this idealistic view that we can get rid of all the plastic, I think, is, is not the way to do this, but make it circular as you have already done. Uh, no, thank you for... for for making that point. Um, we've talked a lot about environment, um, uh, but you, you're running many plants, you're working in the recycling business, you're managing forests. Um, there are also social aspects like uh, paying living wages, making sure that communities you operate in thrive. Can you tell us a little bit about that aspect as well? Because sometimes 
uh, that's p- put to one side? I, I, you know, we operate in 36 countries, 48,000 people. I, I think we have a very kind of keen sense of our social responsibility to, to all those people. The, the first of which is to make sure that they go home safely every single day. That That's, that's the primary concern. Um, we, we benchmark ourselves against the living wage, and I think we, we, I think we pay above the living wage for over 95, 96 percent of our employees. Um, and where we don't, there's there's either legal, local reasons, or we'll catch up. So, um, I, I sort of some of goes back to history, Uwe, because you know when you think about paper mills, uh, generally they kind of started in small towns, and towns grew around them. So you always have a deep connection back to the community in which you operate. Um, I, I think where we see some of the richer aspects of our CSR activities are probably through Latin America, where, where clearly communities don't necessarily always have the advantage that some of our more developed European communities do. Um, so we, we always try and impact those communities a little bit more through either you know, we build community centers in, in, in Mexico City, in El Salvador. We have schools in Colombia. We do something similar in Argentina. So, But there always is a, a definite sense of... And, and it's something that we... We very rarely you won't see us kind of you know you won't see us kind of screaming and shouting about it you won't see us kind of making a big play of it um but if people go onto our website they'll find a thing called our open community brochure and they can see a list across the world of an example of some of the small projects we've done in the local communities but i think we, we see our sense we, we we see ourselves as deeply connected to the environment in which we operate from a, from a people perspective but also from a planet perspective so you know we operate forestry in colombia we do that in, in, in conjunction with the local communities there. Um, and, and we've created employment for the local communities there. We, we probably built most of the infrastructure uh, to a point where we have generations now working in our factories and farms. You know, I was at a I was at an award ceremony here in Ireland. So when you get to 25 years in, in Smurfa Kappa, we have a small lunch for everybody who's at that. Uh, I sat at a table with uh, somebody from a, a plant of ours in the west of Ireland and him, his two brothers, his father, and his grandfather have all worked for Smurfa Capital. So I think collectively they had something like over 88 years of experience. And, and that, that, I think that speaks a lot for, for who we are. Um, and, and that's not atypical. I, I know I've been around the group and I know many fathers and sons uh, who work in the organization, mothers and daughters, brothers and sisters. We had a conversation earlier on about, you know, my nephew who works in the business, um, who, who, who disowns me at every opportunity and has a different surname, so nobody knows who he is. But he's, you know, it's 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 a very familial place, um, and it's something I think that Tony particularly is superb at fostering that idea of. Um, but I think it comes back to, you know, ultimately, I, you can do the E and the G, right? So that you can do those, but if you don't do the S, and if you don't really do the S, you'll be found out. You know, we don't live in a world anymore where. You can avoid the S, and I think I think you know we've had conversations before, and I said like I think the S now is capitalized. I think in in a post-COVID world where people are going, yeah, look, if I, if I deal with the economic part and I'll get the governance right, I'll make sure people are okay. I, I think the next few years will really see how people were 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 dealt with, if you like, by their organizations during COVID. And I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation around retention, around attraction of talent. Mm-hmm. And about the types of organizations that people want to work for. And I suppose that's really where it comes for us. We want to be an organization that people want to work for. Um, and I think you can, only, you can only do that through your values. And, and our values are, you know, loyalty, integrity, and respect. And, and we, we try and live by those every single day in Smurfa Kappa. And that applies to the local community, and it applies to all our plant managers, and it applies to everybody here in, in, in Dublin in the head office. And that's whom we meet. So... I think, you know, some people kind of, when they get to know us a bit, they're, they're kind of slightly blown away by the culture of Smurfa Kappa. And, and I, I realize I say this as somebody who's been in the organization for 28 years and I'm clearly institutionalized. Um, but there's a reason why I've stayed for 28 years too. Um, and it's, it's the people. And it'll always be the people. Um, because that's what makes you get up every day, come in, sit down, go through everything you got to go through because we make the products we make with the people we make in the communities in which we make them. Thank you so much, Ken. I, I must say that uh, I have to remind our audience that uh, we've just been speaking to, to the chief financial officer. And Smurfit Kappa is uh, uh, a growing, very profitable business. 
And uh, people might have not believed that uh, when they just heard you uh, the last two minutes. Um, and it, it is just a symbol that only companies where the leadership uh, from the innovation guy to the supply chain guy to the sales guy and also the finance guy do have fully integrated sustainability. You can be successful in the long term. And you've, you've just ex, uh, exemplified that. And I, I really appreciate it. And thank you for giving us hope that circularity in the packaging industry is not just a pipe dream. Oh, no, it's a reality. And, and Smurf and Kappa is living it daily. Thank you so much. And uh, to our audience, if you have enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to our podcast series or explore the entire catalog of our podcast programming from the conference board by visiting the website at tcb.org slash podcast. You can also write to us at sustainability at tcb.org. Thank you for listening and please join us again when we have uh, uh, again an episode of Let's Talk Sustainable Business. Thank you and goodbye. That was Let's Talk Sustainable Business.